Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 7B of our Residential Technology course. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, electrical systems and introduction to green building systems. Uh, we'll be giving an overview of how the electrical system works in a house, and we'll be discussing some uh, green building systems, which are really just an inter integration of different building systems that are using more green technology, more sustainable technology. In our previous lecture, 7a, we looked at plumbing systems and HVAC systems. So uh, if you're wanting to get in on that, just go back to lecture 7a on my YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the basic uh, systems that we use in electrical. We'll be also discussing some of the uh, ways that it's identified on construction drawings so we understand the constructability aspect and how that impacts um, our ability to be able to build residential projects. We are entirely dependent on our building systems uh, today. You know, 200 years ago, there was no electrical systems in a house. There was no real heating systems other than maybe a fireplace. Uh, so uh, we've come a long way, uh, but that also means that we have a certain amount of dependence. So it's good to know how these systems work. And if you're gonna be uh, managing construction projects, uh, the more you know about the various systems, the better questions you can ask with the particular subcontractors um, that are performing the work for you. After all, you want to make sure that you ask uh, fairly educated questions so that you ensure that you don't have them do something that's not what you want. Uh, so that becomes important from that perspective. Also, you can identify things that maybe don't seem right to you as they're being installed, and that makes it a lot less expensive in the long run. And we have to consider the coordination of the trades so that we don't have rework. In other words, a trade puts something in, but it's in the way of another trade. Typically, electrical work is less likely to be uh, a problem than, say, plumbing or duct work, because big pipes, big ducts, they're harder to move and they take up a lot of space, wires we can move around. But with that said, there's certain wires that we don't want in the proximity of things like heating pipes, where it can uh, cause uh, fatigue on the um, wiring, etc. So we have to keep those things in mind as well. So in Canada, uh, we use the Canadian Electrical Code. All right, so the Canadian Electrical Code, um, also referred to um, as the um, NEC National Electrical Code. Uh, and we have local electrical codes that may be enforced by various hydro authorities, right? And um, jurisdictions. So we wanna make sure that we're um, living up to the specific uh, requirements uh, for the particular code in our jurisdiction. What that means is that you really wanna hire a certified electrician uh, in Ontario, they would require a master electrician's license to perform the work. And that means that not just anybody can install electrical wiring, that you would need to have a skilled professional do it. In other words, if you're a renovation contractor or something of that nature, you shouldn't be running your own wiring. That's not to code, right? You have to have somebody that's trained in that area because errors in that area uh, can cause um, fires and um, extensive damage uh, to homes and people. So circuit, circuit layouts are, um, the layouts of circuits are designed for loading by particular breakers. So we have an electrical service that brings the power into the house and there's different sizes of services that may be required on a house. For example, a 200 amp service might be fairly common. And that just talks to the capacity of the um, electrical system. Uh, you know, if you went back 50 years, uh, 60 years, well, more like probably 60 or 70 years, time flies, uh, you would, uh, a typical house would have like a 60 amp service, not very much power. We didn't have, you know, big screens, laptops, big screen TVs, uh, pretty much all these devices that we have uh, back uh, then. And of course, um, uh, with all these add-ons and our de growing dependence on them, 
uh, our electrical requirements have skyrocketed, uh, not to mention with the coming of electrical vehicles and extra loading that they're going to require. So um, the requirements for the service has to be looked at carefully. Uh, so the service being provided to the house and it goes into an electrical panel and the electrical panel is filled with circuit breakers and each breaker operates a number of outlets and switches and so the electrician has to figure out well what am i going to run off of each breaker and to make sure that it satisfies um, the um, electrical code and so they also want to minimize the amount of wiring that they run. Wiring is not inexpensive. So the more that the more um, outlets and switches and lights that they can run off of a particular breaker, the better. And if they can make them in close proximity so that they don't run wires crisscrossing all over the place, that makes a lot of sense as well. So it ensures that they meet the electrical code and it also ensures that they're being efficient um, in their jobs. Uh, typically in residential construction, the most commonly used wiring when it is not exposed, you know, when it's built into a wall, is what they call non-metallic sheath cable. Kind of goes by the name Romex cable, uh, but the real name is non-metallic sheath cable so it's got like this sheathing covering over it and then it's got individual wires in it and each one of the wires has a coating over it except for the ground wire so it kind of looks like this if you're if you're thinking about it we've got a distribution panel we've got our service where the service comes to um, uh, basically um, the meter and the meter measures how much electricity that you're using and there's all kinds of you know more advancements that are coming with meters um, there's smart meters there's all kinds of uh, new technologies that are developing and monitoring this it used to be that somebody would come to your house and they would actually look at the meter and see how much you used uh, per uh, month uh, of course they've got like wireless technology that sends signals with the amount but uh, Again, that doesn't preclude that there aren't the existing ones out there. So you have a distribution panel, so your electrical panel that people often call it. And then you have your circuits that are feeding the various elements. And some elements, they require um, larger, larger circuit breakers, all right, because they're drawing a higher voltage, like a stove is going to typically be 220 or 240 volts. Uh, volts. Same with a clothes dryer. Um, although a clothes dryer will use less than a stove, so the actual size of the wire, which is bigger than for things like outlets and lights, is actually, um, is actually not as big as the one used for a stove. Again, you know, what, what is the appropriate sizing of wire for the actual purpose that it is being used for? So these are some examples that you see um, used and there are a lot of specific requirements. You know, I'm not even going to try to get into um, what the specific code requirements are because number one, they change all the time. Uh, and number two, um, they are quite varied. You know, if you're in a kitchen, you know, whether you have to use individual circuit breakers for the fridge, uh, for over uh, counter light, uh, over counting out counter outlets, because if you plug in a kettle and a toaster, into a same 15 amp outlet, it's going to um, trip the circuit breaker. So you probably have to, again, I don't wanna hypothesize, but it could be a 20 amp individual circuit breaker that you're using on uh, over counters that maybe split, uh, split, um, split circuit breakers so that they're operate, one outlet is operating off two different breakers. Um, so there's a lot of uh, specifics in how um, the power is supplied. Uh, the, the gauge of the wire, and this gauge system, AWG, it stands for American Wire Gauge. Um, it's it's kind of confusing a little bit. Uh, so the smaller the number, the bigger the diameter. You know, we're kind of used to looking at things um, that the bigger the number, the bigger the diameter. You know, you think of rebar, 10 M bar, 20 M bar. Okay, 10 millimeter diameter, 20 millimeter diameter, it's bigger. American Wire Gauge doesn't work that way. So 14 uh, American wire gauge, you know, most, most uh, lights and outlets are going to be run off of 14. Um, 12, you'll usually see, remember I mentioned 20 amp uh, breakers, like for 
electrical outlets that run off more current and the code might have specific requirements will run 20 amps and usually you'll see sort of a T sort of shape in one of the outlets like over a kitchen counter uh, um, outlet and that's referring that that particular plug is or outlet is a um, 20 amp um, outlet so uh, that's kind of giving you a, a, that aspect now if you're in an older house there's no way like there you know there's they're like 15 amps and uh, well number one you're probably even lucky to have very many outlets over the counter uh, but a new house will have those specific requirements and then you get into um, 10 uh, AWG American wire gauge and that'd be things like uh, clothes dryers and that would be a 30 amp breaker and then you get into eight American wire gauge and now you're getting into electric stoves and oven and that'd be 40 amp breaker so depends what you are using as to the requirements and again you have to go by what an electrician um, knows about the Canadian electrical code and ensures that they're meeting those code requirements but this is giving you kind of an overview and the reason you want to have bigger diameter wires right 14 12 is getting bigger 10 is getting bigger again 8 is getting bigger after that is that you got to think of it almost like turning on a faucet where you've got all these electronic uh, electrons moving through it's like a current all right, that's why they call amperage amps a current. Uh, and if you have a lot of current, a lot of current in a small diameter wire, uh, like if you had 40 amps of current going through a 14 AWG, it's going to have a lot of frictions. The electrons are rubbing against each other, so there's a lot of friction, and that's going to cause heat. If you get too much heat, then it melts off the covering off the wires and then you get a fire, right? So then it starts to heat up in the walls and you get a fire. Uh, so the 14 uh, AWG, that's why it's designed for typical outlets, which aren't really supposed to be using more than that amperage. Again, it can happen, you know, if you've got several uh, hair dryers and things going at the same time on the same breaker, you could have more current running through that. And then that to protect uh, against fires, houses will have circuit breakers in the distribution panel. So the circuit breaker, if it gets more than 15 amps to prevent the melting of the wires, it kicks off. And so then that means something's up. And so then you can reset it. Uh, but hopefully you have plugged whatever caused the problem into a different outlet that's on a different breaker. So you don't have too many things going at once. The goal, of course, with the Canadian Electrical Code or the National Electrical Code is to ensure that in most cases, like it's going to be a rare event where you have too many things plugged into one outlet. So you look at, you know, the changes in the technologies that we, we've been adding on to things and how much current it draws. And then they redesign or make changes to the code to prevent situations where perhaps Maybe a breaker fails. They don't always work 100%. And then it actually overheats and then it melts and causes a fire. These things do happen. Uh, so it's better to be proactive and preventive. So this is how the electrical code gets developed uh, over the um, decades and years. Older wiring in houses. Now this is really old wiring. This is like of the first types of wiring. Uh, it's called knob and tube wiring. If you have a house like this, it really, you shouldn't have this type of wiring anymore. Uh, most insurance companies will not insure houses with this type of wiring anymore. Uh, so if you buy a new house and you want to get it insured, one of the questions they ask, is there knob and tube wiring? And the reason it's knob and tube, these knobs hold the wire away from the joist. Why do they hold the wire uh, away from the joist? Because this has a covering, this wire, but you know when they first invent stuff, it's not the best. And so it would actually heat up, it would get warm. And so you didn't want the warm wire touching the joist because it could catch fire. Same with these tubes, they would drill a hole and put the tube inside the hole so that when the wire goes through the joist, it doesn't heat up the joist to where it catches fire. There are these porcelain tubes that they put in, hence the term Hence the term knob and tube wiring. Also, they would run the hot and the neutral wire separate. 
Uh, of course, today we have non-metallic sheath cable and they just come in one single sheet. And back then, they didn't have any, nothing was grounded. So there was no ground wire, which is not good. Uh, are there older houses today with it? Absolutely, especially in big urban centers like um, Toronto, like Vancouver, like major cities. Um, they just haven't been retrofitted or renovated. Maybe you've got uh, an elderly couple living in a house and they haven't sold the house for, they've lived in it for 40 years. Well, 30, 40 years ago, a lot of people, there were a lot more knob and tube housing than there is now. Uh, but if you sell the house, that's gonna be the predicament you'll be in. If you're buying a house, check it. You wanna check if you're buying a house, does it have knob and tube wiring? The other thing you wanna check for, because I don't think it's in any of my other slides, is does it have aluminum wiring? Aluminum wiring was very popular in the late 1960s, well, probably mid 1960s to the mid 1970s. So houses built during that time, there's a good chance that they have aluminum wiring. Aluminum wiring was less expensive. Copper is very expensive. Aluminum is a little bit less. And they thought it was a good thing at the time. And you know what, if it was properly installed, it was. The problem was the, the wire was a little bit softer than the copper and when the electricians cut off the wires, it would leave a little ring around it. And that little ring would sometimes compress the um, diameter of the wire, which would make that flow of current going through it heat up and that would cause some fires. Uh, so if you have existing house with aluminum wiring, again, a lot, it could be pr have done perfectly safely, uh, but a lot of insurance companies are not thrilled with aluminum wiring. So that could be an expense if you purchase a house that you need to change the aluminum wiring so you can insure um, the house. And these are not in small dollars in changing the aluminum wiring when retrofit, retrofitting the house with it because it means opening up walls, fishing wires, um, and uh, that sort of thing. So just points on that from the history of uh, the electrical systems. I think I've got another cable kind of on that, or another slide on that. So non-metallic sheath cable I mentioned. Armored cabling if it's exposed. So like in residential, you see it in commercial uh, as well uh, if it's exposed. So if I was going to run it on the surface of a wall, I should have an armored cabling. That's protecting it so if you bang into it or knock something against it, it doesn't cut and uh, cause a short or uh, shock or any of those types of things. Of course, uh, for outdoor usage, we could use armor cable, but very often we'll use a rigid conduit of some sort. There's all kinds of different types of rigid conduits from plastic to um, metal uh, that are used, but uh, usually in residential, for the most part, it'd be plastic uh, more than likely if it was being used on the outside. So yeah, here's your sort of history uh, lesson on conductors, as I was saying. Uh, so knob and tube, just two, no ground wire. Then they kind of switched. And this was pretty much, I'd say, from about World War, just after World War II to, I, I, I'm going to say pre-1960. All right, pre-1960. I know my house was built in 1960, so it does have, um, it does have uh, basically a black and a white and a ground wire. So this is your typical Two, what they call two wire, yeah, post-1960, I would agree with that. And as I mentioned, 65 to 75, you might have to worry about aluminum wiring. The knob and tube was copper. Um, also, uh, you may find that um, you may find that you have, in some cases, three wire. So they actually call this two wire, and they call this three wire. They like to confuse you, right? Um, so two wire means there's three wires, it's just that one is a ground. And the ground you know is the ground because it does not have anything covering. Uh, there's no cover on it. It's just basically your copper. And that's for protection. That's, you know, if there's a short, it will remove that excess power and take it to the ground. So it's for protection purposes. Uh, so yeah, so you may have a three wire. Well, three wire would be, for example, if we were using a 200 and volt, 240 or 220 volt circuits. Uh, depending on the voltage that you have in your area. And that would be uh, 120 would be carried on the red, 120 would be carried on the black, and the neutral is just returning excess, um, the excess electrons, right? So basically these would be supplying and this would be returning. And then you have your ground wire. So the ground wire is 
um, again for the protection. So this would be called a three wire. So three wire can be used for, it's gonna be used for 240 volt circuits. It's gonna be a higher uh, AWG. Typically it's gonna be um, eight or 10, unless it's being used for like split circuits or um, uh, for uh, split outlets, right? So if you have a switch that operates the top half of an outlet and the bottom half is always have current, uh, then you use a three wire because the, the wiring gets a little bit more complicated uh, in those cases. So um, that's just your examples there. Um, we also have some new sort of technologies that have been arriving um, over the last 35 uh, years. This one's more over the last um, 15 years or so, uh, which is arc fault circuit interrupters. Arc fault circuit interrupters, uh, they protect against fires. Very often um, a, a, a spark may occur, uh, you know, if you went through a wire with a screw and you left it there, it could be causing little arcs to happen, little arcs of electricity, which are little sparks. And if the spark hits the right thing, who knows, it could start a fire. So there's been a lot of fires. I think these are US numbers on this particular example, um, but uh, you can have that. So it kind of looks like um, a um, typical GFI when you've got it in the outlet uh, portion or it's in the breaker portion. And the Canadian Electrical Code requires arc protectors for a lot of cases. Like uh, <clears throat> it's gotten to be that most of the cases are requiring an arc uh, fault circuit interrupter in new construction. Again, I'm not gonna get into the nuances because they change as I speak, uh, but your electrician will definitely be abreast of what's um, the most current technology on that. Where you would have exceptions would be where you use a GFI, which is gonna be where it's located near water. A GFI, so this is protecting against sparking and fires, which protects buildings and protects people in the buildings. This is a GFI, this pr protects people from being shocked. It measures the current going out and the current coming back. Even some, I forget how many milliamps, but a very small amount, it trips it up. And that means that, you know, you got a, a rate of, it's the old James Bond movie. Uh, they threw the radio, the guy's in the bathtub and he throws the, uh, ra Bond throws the radio into the bathtub. Old Bond, Sean Connery Bond. Uh, so basically he throws the um, radio in the bathtub and the guy gets uh, electrocuted, right? Um, well, if there was a GFI on it, Bond might be in trouble because uh, this would flick it. And the guy in the bathtub, if he's got his gun with him, then you never know. Uh, so that gives you sort of the idea, but it's to protect people. So in construction, if you're working outside, if you're plugging into anything, I probably mentioned it when we talked about safety uh, in our other courses, uh, you would wanna make sure that you're plugging into a GFCI, uh, ground fault circuit interrupter, and you can have the same deal. So you can have outlets, and just because it doesn't have the button doesn't necessarily mean the outlet is not protected because you could have an outlet downstream that is wired from this outlet and they call this the line and the other one the load. So you can actually daisy chain a number of outlets on a single um, GF, um, GFI. Also though, if you're gonna run a bunch of outlets, probably the, the best way to do it is to have a circuit breaker, which is a GFI circuit breaker, and it will trip uh, for that particular one. Again, the Canadian Electrical Code, it'll get into, in some cases you have to have a breaker, in other cases an outlet is fine. But if you run into a, a house where all of a sudden something stopped working, um, number one, I would, be checking, well, does it, it, it's pretty straightforward. If it's got this, you unplug it and then you reset it. And then you, but you gotta ask yourself why, what caused it to go off so that you correct the problem. Uh, so you'd reset it. Uh, the other thing is if it goes off, I check the first thing is I check the electrical panel. Are any of the breakers off, right? And check the electrical panel, are any of the breakers off? Uh, if uh, one of the breakers is off, reset uh, the breaker. If it is, off and you've checked all the breakers and they seem okay, then what you gotta do is uh, check, uh, maybe it's a different outlet that's not looking like this and it looks like a regular outlet. Is there another 
one of these located, usually not too far, because remember electricians don't wanna to run too many wires too long. Like, is there a bathroom nearby? Try, try the button, the reset button, and see if that other outlet comes on, because maybe it was run off of this particular outlet. Uh, so that can help to be a little bit of quick troubleshooting when I get an electrician if you don't need one uh, in those um, circumstances. And of course, if you go down to an electrical panel and one of these is uh, switched to the off position, it'll also have a reset button and then you'd reset it here. Um, on, you just press the button and it resets it, you flick it. Same thing uh, with a GFI if it's got a circuit breaker, they look similar that way. But again, GFIs protect people from shocks directly and uh, arc, fault, arc fault circuit interrupters, AFCIs, protect um, buildings, which in turn protect people. Let's be realistic about it, that protects people. Just not from a direct typical shock. Uh, so yeah, as I was mentioning, we've got our electrical panel. So it lo usually looks like this maze of wires. So the electrician had figured out how they're running their uh, outlets and their switches and then one of the wires is going to return to home so they call it returning to home which is the panel and then at a certain point then they're going to install their breakers and they're going to install their wiring and this uh, particular panel was done rather neatly you see how neatly the the wiring's coming in from behind at first it's like this they drilled a bunch of holes fed it in from behind very clean installation it's usually gonna be on a piece of plywood or OSB like this one is. There's specific requirements around that in the electrical code. And usually if it's done well, and again, there's usually some requirements in the electrical code in new construction that so many breakers, uh, uh, there has to be some uh, space left for future capacity. So some space left for future capacity. There's tons of space left for future capacity. Example. Just going back here, the basement's not finished. Finish the basement, it's gonna take a few more of these. Put a, a stove in the basement, it's gonna take a few more again. Um, so and you've got um, those types of things going on. So we I, I mentioned a uh, split switched receptacle, so there you go. So here's your switch, there's your outlet. And what happens is these outlets, uh, typical outlets, they have a tab here, the electrician breaks the tab and this would be a three wire. So one of the hot wires would be on the switch and that would go to the bottom screw. The other hot wire would go to the top screw. The white, liar, the white uh, wire, which is a neutral wire, would go back and the ground wire just goes back, right? So this would be actually the ground typically in this drawing and that would be the white neutral wire. So when I flick the switch, it's only flicking on one of them, right? You wouldn't wanna have your alarm clock on uh, on an outlet if you flick the switch and both both sides of it went off. That wouldn't be too good. Uh, I feel like half my students, that's what they do. But anyways, <laughs> uh, so we've got, you can see how this runs from, I only said half the students, not all. of. So you can assume you're in the good half. All right, so uh, the wire comes down to the outlet and then it's going on to the next outlet. This outlet is for this room, this outlet's for this room. I think this is a bedroom over here. Right, and that's typically, and then you see it's going somewhere else. And so that's, that's why you're running to running to running. And they're trying to figure out if they're very good at it to minimize their waste, the waste of uh, wiring. Also, you don't wanna run wiring any longer than you need to. There's more resistance in the wire the longer that you run it. Very, very long extension cords have problems, especially if they're only um, 14 uh, gauge or uh, in some cases, 16 gauge, a lot of cases, 16 gauge extension cords. So they run into problems when you've got a long extension cord because there's more resistance built up in the wire. Uh, a three-way switch uh, will have a three wire. So this one here looks like, you can see a black, a red, and a ground wire here. Um, this actually looks like it's a rectangular box though, so it might not be for a switch, but maybe. Uh, so we've got uh, here, we've got our power supply. You have a special switch that you get. You wouldn't know the difference. Like you would look at it and on the outside where you see it, it looks just like any other switch, but the mechanism in the switch is different. And that allows for you to use a three-way switch. So think of any, any switch at uh, a staircase. At the bottom of the stairs, you can switch the light on. At the top of the stairs, you can switch the same light off. 
So they have these special switches so that, you know, when I click this, now it is a closed circuit. So it will light up the device. If I click this one, now it's an open uh, circuit. So now this device will go off. If I go down the stairs and I flick this down here and that was over here, then it's closed again and it would go on. That's a split switch receptacle. And that's why it needs three wires. You've got these two hot conductors and they call them messengers or travelers. And those wires, it flicks which one's hot and which one's not hot. Um, they're not both hot at the same time. Uh, it's just switching which one, so that allows you to be able to do that. It's actually very sort of simple, the logic behind it. Same thing, you, you'll find three-way switches in, you know, if you've got a, a doorway to a garage, you flick the switch, and then if you go out the garage door, you flick the switch, it shuts it on and off. Or if you've got a room that's got more than one entrance to it, it should have three ways, so you can enter the room, and then when you leave the room at the other door, it flicks off. So you do find them fair, fairly frequently. You can look on your construction drawings, the Brook drawings that we've been looking at in the Understanding Construction Drawings textbook, and you'll see three-way switches at the stairs, and you'll see it at rooms where you've got more than one entrance, etc. Uh, so here's sort of giving you some uh, guidelines again. I already kind of went through that with the different amperages uh, for the circuit breaker sizes. This is your electrical service entering the house. You know, in new construction, production construction, uh, production home building, it's going to be in the ground. So it's going to come up from the ground. Uh, that way they don't have it on hydro poles. You know when there's big storms and the wind hits and lightning strikes and all these different things. Uh, it does damage to the hydro lines or we get a ice storm and then they all come crashing down. Well, if it's running under the ground, you don't have as many problems. You have flooding problems and different issues, but it's uh, considered to be more resilient. So new production homes will typically have that. If you're in a big urban center, it's going to be whatever you've got. Like if you're in Toronto and you're tearing down a house and you're going to put a new house on that lot, the whole street is above ground. Guess what? You're going to be above ground as well. So that just depends on where you're building, how you're building. But if it's like new uh, streets and that sort of thing, the infrastructure will be in the ground. More resilient. Pot lights, all kinds of different pot lights today. And pot lights, uh, the technology is always uh, changing on these things. And so pot lights, they're mostly going to be LED pot lights. They draw a lot less current than they used to. Uh, so it's not, pot lights aren't the same problem that they um, were, but again, you got to check the technology and check what's allowed and what's not allowed, etc. There was a lot of problem previously with pot lights that they would heat up between the joists and you had to have uh, protection around them if it was insulated and all these other things. Um, so you have to, tech, you have to, from an electrical point of view, the electrician has to know what is proper with this particular uh, system. But one of the things we have been improving drastically in construction is the amount of uh, current uh, and efficiency of our lighting systems. You know, we went to these CFL bulbs, which nobody really liked too much, but they were much more efficient. And now we're, we're going to LEDs, which were at first very expensive, but are now not that expensive. And uh, they last a lot longer. CFLs, we were told they last longer, but they never seem to. And uh, they, because they're using a lot less energy, they tend to produce a lot less heat. So uh, there's a lot of advantages there uh, that way. So that's kind of sort of the overview I wanted to give you on electrical. But I also wanted to talk a little bit today about um, green building and how that integrates with our systems. Now I'm going to talk a lot more about green building and when we talk about the building envelope. We talk about the building envelope, I'm kind of looking at sealing up um, the walls and increasing the insulation to reduce loads like what I was talking about. You know, if you've got a super insulated building, it's not that hard to heat it. Uh, so um, that that's a, a very important function, at least with the technology we have today. I don't know, in a few years, the way I see technology changing it might not be such a big deal that we got to have these super insulated, super tight houses because the technology is so inexpensive and efficient. It's not, it's not a, it's a non issue anymore, but for now it's definitely an issue. And so we have to think about it in those terms. So 
uh, there's a lot of new innovative uh, systems that are coming in the market and uh, it's hard to keep up with all of them, but I'll try to give you a, a good sort of uh, overview. Uh, photovoltaic cells um, capture energy from the sun, uh, solar panels basically. Um, wind energy uh, uh, that uses wind turbines produce electricity can be controversial. Um, ground source heat pumps that harness stable ground temperatures, preheat, precool the air in the building can be very good depending on the space and property requirements that you have. Um, and these systems also include typically HRVs or ERVs, heat recovery ventilators or energy recovery ventilators. Uh, I'll talk about that more in chapter 12, but just as a quick prelude, and if you move ahead to chapter 12, you'll see some images of it. Uh, it takes the air from inside, the stale air from inside, and warm air from inside, maybe a little bit um, polluted air from inside with off-gassing of different materials, uh, plastics and different things. And it exhausts it out the house. And at the same time, it sucks in fresh air and it goes through a heat exchanger. Heat exchangers like thin, thin membranes of usually like a metal like aluminum and it transfers warm moves from cold hot warm warm goes from warm to cold so that warm air transfers its heat to the metal and the cooler air coming in picks up that heat so there's an exchange a heat exchange that's why they call it a heat exchanger uh, which is more efficient than opening the window you open the window you're going to get fresh air but then what's the point of making a super sealed house if you're going to open up all the windows? Um, makes no sense. So um, in cases like that, you install a HRV or an ERV. An ERV, the, the simple difference is with humidity. Um, so that exchange is about 90. It depends on the HRV, but they can be as high as 90%. So you're only really losing 10% of the heat through that process, yet at the same time, you're getting fresh air. Uh, the house I'm in right now in Collingwood, it was not, it was built not that long ago, and it's a pretty energy efficient house. So I installed after the fact an HRV in this house to have more fresh air coming in. Uh, on my other house in Toronto, there is no way I'm gonna put an HRV on that because it leaks everywhere. It leaks at the floors, leaks, because it was built in 1958 and there's really no insulation in the walls and so it would what am I gaining by that I get lots of fresh air in that house right so but this house is pretty tight uh, so that makes sense in this case tankless hot water heaters um, those have become uh, very uh, popular and as the technology is improving there were some little bugs in the beginning with the tankless hot water heaters uh, took longer to get the hot water and a few things, but now the technology is very good. So why do I need this big tank heating it and I go on vacation all the time and it keeps heating it or I got to put it in vacation mode all the time. Whereas a, a tankless hot water heater, it's on demand. I turn it on and then it, it heats it as it's coming to me. Um, solar hot water systems, um, that can be effective. I'd say it's more effective in certain climate, some climates than others. I don't think it's as effective in our climate, but it is, it is a mechanism for use and it has been used. I think I have a photo example of one that's uh, used down near the Danforth area in Toronto. Um, more efficient furnace. Well, you know, uh, furnaces are about as efficient as they're going to get today. They're in the, in the mid 90s, uh, so 95% efficiency, 93% efficiency. There's probably ones that are slightly more than that too. Um, but 20 years ago, they were like mid efficiency. So they were like, that was good if you had 75, 80%. 40 years ago, they were like 50 to 60% efficient. So um, as far as efficiency goes, there's been a straight uh, curve towards um, more and more efficient furnaces. And all that means is um, the energy that you're losing um, in the process. So how much energy is being exhausted up the chimney or out the wall? That's why high efficiency furnaces, um, they can exhaust out the wall because it, it's hot, but it's not hot, hot. Uh, so um, as opposed to having to run it up a chimney. Um, so there is those um, differences. It's also the same thing with 
gas-fired uh, fireplaces are uh, typically uh, very efficient. If you've got a high efficient gas fireplace, uh, then it'll just, just, all it needs to do is exhaust out the wall, right? And a regular fireplace, by the way, if you love the natural fireplace, it's not very sustainable and it's not very green. Uh, the traditional fireplace probably runs in at about 40% efficiency. Not too good. Even the traditional Rumford fireplace, which has splayed walls a little bit and it's a little bit different design, uh, you might be getting up to 50% efficiency. Um, inserts can get higher, but those are some of um, those aspects, the big differences, right? Uh, ECM uh, blower motors, uh, there were some initial problems with these too, that they were breaking down, but they've corrected that as well. So it just means a DC motor. Uh, that's using direct current to decrease energy uses on your furnaces. So the, because the fan on the furnaces would typically use a fair bit of energy, uh, which uh, the um, ECM uh, motors or DC motors use a lot less, a lot, lot less. Uh, they pay for themselves usually in about three years or so. Uh, drain water, heat exchangers. Yeah, uh, I don't know what the research is on this, uh, but it has been become very popular. A lot of the, um, a lot of the, like uh, Enbridge gas and that they promoted them to help to try to reduce um, consumption. Uh, it's a drain pipe. I can't remember if I've got it in one of the slides, but it's a drain pipe and it has a copper pipe that wraps around the the drain pipe. So the copper drain pipe and it's got another copper supply line that wraps around that um, pipe and essentially what it's um, doing is uh, the heat from the drain water you take a hot shower coming down or a bath coming down uh, the drain pipe it always the water always circles around the edge of the pipe as it's draining it heats up the pipe and that preheats the water going into the hot water tank. And so that circulation is um, saving some energy. Uh, so that's sort of the concept behind that. Eliminate the problem and you get um, uh, the hot water tank that basically does it instantly uh, with tankless hot water tank. And then you don't have to have that same issue anyways. So preheating it's not gonna necessarily help too much in that case. Gray water recycling of wastewater that's generated. Um, that's uh, another area uh, where we waste a lot of water. We waste a lot of water. Look, we're located on the Great Lakes, uh, the world's biggest sort of natural um, fresh water. So unfortunately, as a result of that, I think we're pretty wasteful with our water. Uh, go to Las Vegas and people are... Uh, pretty cognizant of water usage because they have very short supply of it. Um, everything, everybody's uh, cognizant of it. Maybe not the Bellagio with the beautiful fountains, but uh, <laughs> uh, the um, they do zero landscaping so that they don't have to overwater things. You know, you don't, you're trying to keep grass in the desert because Las Vegas is in the middle of the desert is is complicated, right? Uh, we tend to. Uh, waste a lot of water. We have sprinkler systems that go on when it's raining and all those types of things. But that's not a good thing. So what we want to do is to um, be good citizens uh, is looking at gray water recycling. <clears throat> and gray water recycling is using not soiled water like from a toilet, but water say from a sink. You know, you did the dishes, that water, and reusing it. So that water that came from a sink gets pre-cleaned so it's not going to smell or anything and it goes into your toilet so the next time you flush the toilet it's getting a second use the same water and so that's using gray water and it's quite an efficient way because toilets use a substantial amount of water even the new toilets that we've got that don't use so much water which are way better than the ones before uh, use uh, that same water a second time so that can be um, helpful from that perspective. So it's really looking at the different things and different systems and how they can integrate. This was, I took a group uh, years ago to the Equilibrium House. This was down by O'Connor Drive, not too far from the 
Danforth. And this was a renovation on an existing house to get it to net zero. I think I talked earlier in the course about net zero and houses that basically come up with as much energy as they use. And so, as I was mentioning, they had um, for their um, for their electricity needs, they had um, your photovoltaic um, cells to create uh, electricity for the house. Uh, they had a whole bunch of different systems and the house was reclad. They even had to get a variance because what they did was they added an extra foot to the outside of the house um, so that they could insulate it, spray foam it. So what they actually did was they put vertically like eye joists on the outside of the house and then they spray foam, foam between the eye joists uh, and then they put the siding outside of that. So they were able to add onto this existing house. They had to reside the whole house and new windows, more energy efficient triple glazed windows uh, to uh, seal that up. And then because it was an equilibrium house, it meant that it was tested and measured. I think it was for three years after construction to see how close it got to net zero. I think this one was around uh, 95% efficient, 96%, which for a renovation is very good. Um, very good from that perspective. And they tried uh, a bunch of, um, of uh, different technologies as well. So, uh, and, some, and some of the technologies were, were new at the time and uh, like um, the AC-DC inverter. So when you get solar uh, energy from the sun, it goes into DC, uh, direct current, but then you have to convert it to alternating current. And when they originally did this kind of system, they had like one converter for the whole system. The problem was the way it worked was uh, if you had snow over part of it, it meant none of them were producing electricity. And of course, what do we have in the winter? We have snow over it. Uh, so then they went to micro inverters, so each panel. So if you had snow over this, the rest of the panels, if there was sunlight, would produce energy. So that was much, much better. Uh, we talked about ground source heat pump. So when you get to a certain depth in the ground, the temperature is stable, right? That's why, remember we talked about uh, how deep do you have to go in Canada to be below the frost line. And so when we talked about Southern Ontario, uh, we were saying, well, the frost is gonna get to four feet, below, not, not as deep as four feet, so we have to go four feet. Well, at a certain depth, uh, you get to a more neutral temperature so in the winter and in the summer it doesn't change much depending where you are at and depending on the depth say that depth is like uh will you will you will use fahrenheit here i'll i'll, I'll convert it in my head we'll say that is, we'll use celsius let's say it's um around 16 degrees celsius all right so you're in the middle of the winter it's minus 25 up here but down here, it's not as, uh, it's not minus 25, okay? And so what happens is you have a circulation of fluid going through here, and it's, of course, got something in it that, that would stop it from freezing and breaking the pipes if something ever happened, like especially at this level. Uh, and what it does is it picks up the heat from down here, comes back into the house, and uh, it is preheated. So that heat, then is utilized. Now it can be utilized into a heat pump, it can be used into hydronics, uh, heat, a hydronic heating system, but let's say it's coming back at the house say at uh, 14 degrees Celsius. Well now you just got to heat it from 14 degrees Celsius up to maybe you feel comfortable in the winter with 20 degrees Celsius or 21 degrees Celsius. So what's that? A six or seven Celsius difference. That's a big difference than going from, you know, minus 20 to plus 20, the amount of energy that that's requiring, where you've got the air exchange that's happening in your house, warm air moving to the outside, sucking in cold air. Uh, that's a big difference. So that can save you a substantial amount of money. The downside of this is it's currently pretty expensive to do. Uh, but, uh, and so that means the payback period is a long period of time. Usually people look a lot at payback periods and how long does it take to pay back for this particular system? Uh, so I think, unless the prices have changed somewhat, you were looking at somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars for a system like this, uh, as compared to you know your regular system, which might be like six thousand, seven thousand uh, dollars. So there's a long payback period. 
going back to solar panels, the prices have been steadily dropping. So like it's, it's becoming much, much more cost effective and much, much more competitive. And, you know, there's this time where it crosses and then it's like you could have somebody that actually doesn't believe in climate change and they would be going for solar because it's so much cheaper. You know, can, can you imagine that? Right. So um, then you don't have to convince. Uh, but uh, these technologies are constantly evolving, constantly approve and improving. So where I say now, six months, a year from now, they're incrementally better. In some cases, they can be, you know, one, one order of magnitude better, at least in price. Uh, so we have our um, gray water uh, recycling. So it's a gray water recycling. This is from the Courtright Center. Uh, that they had and they had they had the whole nine yards they had um, it's a it's a center where they're testing different different technologies but they had ground source heat pumps they had uh, photovoltaic cells they had wind turbines they have uh, gray water systems and in some municipalities like in the states like I was talking about those some of those states they require uh, gray water that's it's not like a choice like it's building code you have to do this uh, because they want to conserve their water as much as possible. So um, sometimes when things uh, become uh, urgent, then it becomes mandated. So we have this gray water cycling system. And as I was saying, it's taking in water from the sinks. And this is from a TAC box detail. So Toronto Area Chief Building Officials Committee. So municipalities are looking at this. It could be a building code item, but Toronto could say, well, that's fine. That's the Ontario Building Code, but we're going to require new houses to have this. That's a possibility. Some municipalities require that. Uh, so they can up from the standards of the building code. Kind of the differences, uh, local bylaws that can be enacted that uh, municipalities can play upon, especially if they're thinking more green, more sustainable building. And we define the difference, right, between green and sustainable building. Uh, so we have, uh, in case you didn't get that, green building uh, is just building above minimum building code standards, building to a higher standard than is currently required. Sustainable building is building to a, a, a point where future gen it's going to impact positively future generations as a result of being sustainable. Net zero sustainable. That'd be an example. So we have uh, the water then going back. And, sorry, the water's coming. Sorry, I did that backwards, didn't I? Uh, from the shower, it's coming down the dash line. All right, so that's your water coming down into the gray water system. Um, and uh, that water then would feed the um, uh, toilet here. So that water would then feed the toilet. This water, we can't... Um, take because it's going into the toilet drain so that one's out the way this was plumbed um, but basically from our bathtub from our shower uh, uh, from our washing machine goes in here uh, it's cleaned all right it's filtered it's not super clean so there's some maintenance issues that you have to deal with with this uh, but the water then that goes to the toilet is effectively clean enough for the toilet water it's not potable water it's toilet water and all the piping has to be identified, not potable water. There's special stickers, etc., that have to be put on it. They're always worried about somebody, you know, a handy person going into their house later on and all of a sudden hooking up to a uh, line that's going to the toilet. That's not potable water that thinks they're going to feed a new bathroom sink or something. So, <laughs> so the, they always have to be concerned about those things. Um, also, I, I just added this. It's not in your textbook. I should have put it in the most recent edition. Um, I might have said something about it, and I can't remember now. Uh, this is from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, I think pretty soon this is going to be a building code requirement, too, from the electrical side. Uh, it only makes sense. Uh, so charging stations, uh, making sure they're all wired into everybody's garage, uh, that they're accessible. Uh, it only makes sense. Uh, you can charge a vehicle with a regular outlet. It just it takes forever. Uh, so I don't think that that's um, the uh, best a level. So over here it says your EV can be plugged right into a standard outlet. Da, 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 level one charging. So that's going to get you about eight kilometers of range per hour. 
So you leave it plugged in overnight, you're going to have 64 hours of range. I don't think that's going to be too great. Uh, but it does mean you could plug in anywhere, right? So if you're visiting somebody and they weren't too far away, you could plug in. Level two charging. This one probably very likely, especially for people that retrofit their house, uh, existing house uh, for it, because the retrofit system is similar to uh, uh, what you'd use for a clothes dryer. So you'd use like a AWG American wire gauge number 10 and a 240 volt system. Uh, so similar to the dryer plug, and that would get you around 50 uh, kilometers range per hour. So, you know, you come home at uh, eight o'clock at night, you plug it in, you leave at six in the morning, that's 10 hours, you know, a new Tesla probably gets you about that 500 kilometers of range. Uh, so that probably would um, suit you. Level three, uh, that requires a much heavier voltage and that's likely gonna require changes to your service or maybe they'll mandate that the electrical service, the distribution panel and the service entering the house will be increased in future as a minimum, just because if we're um, getting away from carbon-based fuels, uh, that that system is ready as slowly we shift over to electric um, vehicles. Um, so uh, also, if you go to these um, charging stations, you know, uh, on the highway and that, they're pretty quick uh, so that you can at least get going again. So uh, that's uh, sort of that background. They've actually standardized the plug outlets in to my understanding in North America, in case I'm off with that, but that was my background uh, research on that, which is amazing from that perspective. Who wants to have 20 different kinds of plugs and voltages and everything? And uh, you can clearly see if we're talking about being uh, energy um, efficient, some of it uh, relates to, well, how does the energy produce? You know, if you're near Niagara Falls and it's hydroelectric, well, that's pretty good. Or if it's nuclear, I guess that's pretty good. Nuclear has its own issues. Um, if it's coal-based electric electricity being produced, it's still, I think would be, I, I don't have the exact numbers on that, but because it's more economically produced, it'd still be better than just gas. Um, but uh, the cost is pretty substantially lower using electricity uh, to produce. And especially if you are charging it overnight where the demand on our electrical system is much lower, um, that is a positive uh, impact as well. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages um, to that that I um, see that way. And so I see this evolution uh, occurring. So I think once, the, once it gains enough momentum, then it's just the tipping point. And so that's a, a positive for everyone, I believe. And it's not going to happen overnight because we're going to slowly get rid of the gas and vehicles, meaning that people, when you start to go to buy a new gas vehicle and you've got all these choices with electrical vehicles, some people will decide, okay, maybe I'll go with the electric one. And as the cost comes down, uh, which it has dramatically, and as you can see, uh, the savings in gas, it doesn't take too long for a combination of those events to make this a um, logical choice. And that's how building codes change. Right? Somebody shouldn't buy a new house. It's like, where do I plug my car in? Car house was just built. That's um, not a good thing. So a lot of key terms that we talked about uh, in this uh, lecture and a lot of probably new, new ideas and new uh, technologies as well. Just be attuned to it. Change is happening as we speak. And uh, it's exciting. It's really exciting. I love when things are changing and new things are occurring uh, and trying to keep ahead of the curve. It's funny, just uh, the other day, my wife um, was plugging in uh, an out, uh, was plugging in a plug and it had a GFI, not a GFI, it, had, it was uh, basically had about five or six things plugged in and she kind of jammed it in kind of uh, roughly and it, it sparked, right? And so it kicked the, the breaker, uh, but she wasn't sure what happened. And the breaker downstairs, it was an arc uh, fault um, circuit interrupter and so she had tried it but it wasn't working but there was a reset button so you had to press the reset and then click it but the first thing I did was I checked the GFI because I wasn't sure if it was a load off of that or if it was on the panel etc but I already had in my head all the different checkpoints and things that I've got to check before I start thinking it's um, something um, more than that and uh, so 
understanding how the different technologies work, understanding the new technologies, being able to look at a set of drawings and interpret that information is a positive uh, skill set and it's a required skill set for success in the construction industry. So that's what I wanted to cover. Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and uh, signing off and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.